Yo, what up, everybody? I'm your host, Will. Welcome to Phantom Frequency. If this is your first time joining us, it's right there in the name. We cover all types of topics in the world of pop culture, primarily movies and TV, but we also go into anime, music, wrestling, all different types of topics. So if you like any of that and you dig the vibe and you love all the stuff that we're talking about, click all the buttons below the video and show that support for the channel. It really does help us out immensely, and we appreciate all the new subscribers coming in lately, interacting with the videos, and interaction is more important than ever. That is for sure, because this algorithm is hella weird but thank you for joining us we are finally continuing the x-men review series aka the hype train to deadpool and wolverine deadpool 3 coming out in the end of june i believe on the 26th if i'm not mistaken july 26th so that weekend we're gonna have a big old spoiler discussion and everything like that maybe even a little spoiler free one because i'm gonna try to go see it that thursday night and then get a, a spoiler free type of thing going up that friday and then the following Monday, we'll get a whole big spoiler discussion. But so far, we have done the original X-Men, Brian Singer-esque trilogy. You know what I mean? Between 2000 X-Men, 2004's X2, X-Men United, and, of course, the highly disappointing 2006 X-Men The Last Stand, if I remember correctly. Or 2007, actually. My bad. Um, so, yeah. And then we've also covered one of the worst prequels of all time. And I'm talking about um, X-Men Origins Wolverine. So, now we are finally continuing with the prequel slash reboot X-Men First Class, released way back in the day in May 25th, 2011, or at least feels like way back in the day to me, back when I was just a child with a gleam of the future in my eye, man. I was, uh, let's see, that would have been right before the summer between my, uh, so yeah, that was right around the end of my junior year of high school, so much different time in my life, one of the funnest times of my life, and these X-Men films have always been special to me, not just because I was an X-Men animated series fan growing up, not just because, um, you know, I love the original X-Men films and all that stuff, but it also became something that was a bit of a communal experience with my family or friends, and that was kind of the era, this era right here was kind of when I started going with my friends, actually over my family members, where me and my dad would go to all the MCU films before I started going with Miguel and Skippy in my later years, like, you know, phase three and whatnot the first two phases me and my dad went to go see all those films together and then me and my uh, my dad showed me the original x-men on vhs um back in the day and then we saw x2 and my mom went with me to see x-men uh last stand so i had seen all those in the theater origins i heard a lot of bad things about so i wait till it came on cable about a year or so later then i finally saw it and was highly disappointed so it had been a minute since i went into the theater to watch an x men film and there was a, and there wasn't as much hype going into this one we saw the previews for it i remember me and drew specifically talked about it cuz we were kind of some of the few homies that really had a lot of x men knowledge prior to those films uh, around the time those films came out and everything like that, the original three. And then Miguel was another homie of ours that we had met, um, you know, a couple years prior to that. And we had always, you know, started getting close and going to movies together in high school, you know, as teenagers do. And we all decided we'd get together and go check it out at the drive-in. We saw Alien Prometheus, uh, the Alien, the lamest Alien movie of all time, in my opinion, Prometheus, and X-Men First Class as a double feature, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong, depending... So I might have to fact check that, but I believe we might have saw that as the double feature at the at the drive-in. Because for some of you Gen Zs and some of you youngins out there, there was a time where they had a drive-in theater where you would go, get to a certain station on your radio, and it, you would be able to hear the audio of the film. And then you'd park in a good spot, grab your snacks, eat in your car, chill outside your car if you have a truck and the you know a bed of the truck or whatever, do your thing and uh, all that good stuff. And if you're sneaky, you can find the right station and find another movie and watch a different one. Just FYI. But uh, if you could find one these days. But the one we went to actually see this at is permanently closed, unfortunately. So R.I.P. to the Mission Tiki. If you know, you know. But uh, but yeah, man. So we had uh, we had, we didn't have like a ton of hype going into it, but we definitely wanted to go check out an X Men film. We, we love those movies, you know. And Marvel films were starting to kind of like become popular at that time. Phase one was kind of in full swing. We were leading up to Avengers about a year from this time. Um, some of that stuff started to get out there. So the superhero kind of comic book movie genre was definitely starting to heat up after The Dark Knight and Iron Man hit in the same year and things like that. And we started to kind of get a lot more of these films out there. But the X-Men's always been popular with a lot of the normies as well and kind of been kind of that gateway for people to get into comic book films. So a lot of people, you know, wanted to go see this thing. It was a pretty good turnout when we went to see it. And I remember, funny enough, I actually ended up falling asleep at some point during the movie. But I remember really enjoying that first 30 minutes or so that I saw. And then I woke up at the end when they were in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I was like, whoa, what the hell did I miss? And then getting to see the whole like downfall of Eric and Magneto, a.k.a. Professor X and Magneto's 
uh, Eric and uh, Charles's um, friendship and the way that the rivalry kind of started right then and there when Magneto took a stand and wanted to go against the humans and Xavier, of course, Charles Xavier didn't want to do that. So just getting to see the way that that all went down, I was like, oh shit, I must have really missed something cool here because they they definitely nailed that. So I finally went back at some point um, when it came on cable and finally saw the film and fell in love with it instantly. This is definitely still one of my all-time favorite X-Men films. And I will actually say this. This is one of the first times I would say at this point... Uh, X2 to me felt like the most pure, more X-Men movie out of all th the four previous releases, but they always felt like Wolverine and the X-Men. No um, no association to you know the animated series later, but it always kind of had that vibe where Wolverine was kind of the one that was front and center. But in this, it kind of it really felt like an ensemble piece and something focused on Charles Xavier finding his first class of students, the original kind of four X Men, if you will, and kind of building out a bit of a bigger team from there, and them kind of going into their first big, you know, international conflict and them dealing with the government and them coming to terms with their. Um, their, um, their mutant, um, uh, you know, just the overall relations with humans and mutants and them coming to terms with how they are judged and how they're preconceived and how the world will go against them when they are not understood and when they are feared and everything going down with that. And then Sebastian Shaw, that villain played by Kevin Bacon brilliantly just brought everything together in such a phenomenal way. And everything just felt like true X-Men, you know, politics, government intrigue going on, you know, the whole kind of 60s, uh, 70s kind of James Bond flair that Matthew Vaughn as the director of this film brought to it. I just thought this had a really, really great vibe. And I just have a blast every time I watch this film. And not that it's necessarily a perfect film or anything like that, but there's very few negatives to it. And as a, as a, as a Marvel comic book movie it just really hits and it has the perfect amount of grounded nature with the spectacle that you come to expect and want from the x-men and that is the the brilliant thing with this movie that it has some of the darkest things in any of the x-men movies and it really is able to establish you know some nice situational humor and some great character development and you know that feeling of camaraderie and that feeling of uh, friendship and, and bond and a bond of a family is truly there but the darkness in some of the more gritty parts of the x-men story and some of that kind of stuff Stuff that comes out of politics and the kind of time period that they're living in and playing off of, you know, the parallels between prejudice and all that other stuff and racism and whatnot, right? <laughs> Even sexism, if you want to look at it that, look at it that way. So all of that definitely plays such a key role in this. And that's why this film to me just has the true identity of X-Men as a, as a story and as, and as characters and, and as the source material really stands and what it really stands for and what makes it special and gives it the identity that we've all come to love it for and Matthew Vaughn truly understood that as the director and I'm so glad that he got to be able to be the guy that brought the X-Men back to glory and kind of was able to take a shot I do love Days of Future Past don't get me wrong still one of my other favorites but I do feel like Brian Singer is not as strong of a director you know with a great script when you give him a great script I don't think he's necessarily as on point as Matthew Vaughn was with this because this kind of had all the flair and the action of what Brian Singer brought to it kind of matched up some of the elements that he brought into so it did feel like an actual continuation but had its own fresh vibe and it had its own unique flavor to it as well and that brutality and that grittiness definitely comes from Matthew Vaughn's sensibility as well and that was one of the things that I do miss in the franchise since then other than um um other than what um uh oh my gosh I can't believe I'm forgetting his name uh the director of Logan oh my gosh uh uh James Mangold the whole vibe that he brought to that um, even more so than his first film with the Wolverine, aka the Wolverine, that came out a few years, a uh, handful of years prior, which was good, but the third act totally fell, falls apart. So that was kind of where we saw James Mangold really shine, and this was where we really saw Matthew Vaughn directing. I feel like for the first time, even outside of Kick Ass, really come together and feel, and you really get to see the potential of what he has as a filmmaker and what and, and what heights he's going to reach, and the creative flavor and the flair that he brings to his projects. It's truly his own flavor. And that's something that I truly miss from some of the um, Marvel films as well, where it's able to continue its franchise, do what it needs to do as a sequel or prequel, or set things up in the right way that feels organic and feels earned. But at the same time, I also feel like that he didn't shy away from the grittiness and giving it its own identity and making sure that you can identify with these characters and really go in with their journey full on in this, man. So that was just done so brilliantly well. And, you know, just, you know, obviously the cast is fucking phenomenal. And we had some of the best overall comic book movie casting of all time in this. You know what I mean? Between James, uh, between James McAvoy as Charles Xavier. 
Michael Fassbender as Eric Lencher, a.k.a. Magneto. Jennifer Lawrence as Mystique. Not necessarily as strong as the first two, but I see what they were going for with the whole Raven thing and with her kind of the before, the Mystique, the, the assassin, the kind of uh, uh, villain that we come to know down the line with the Brotherhood of Mutants and everything like that and more of her identity from the comics. You do see some of that, um, some of that uh, framework here, but I do feel like that Jennifer Lawrence was a bit miscast and doesn't quite feel like a young version of that Rebecca Romaine character because that's the continuity that they're playing in is that they're pretty much picking up earlier with the same continuity and leading up to it in a much more subtle way than what was happening in the um, in the second installment of this quadrilogy, if you will. But uh, but yeah, so everything going down with that. But the casting that I thought also was obviously phenomenal in general, other than Kevin Bacon, who I already mentioned as Sebastian Shaw, excellent uh, performance. Rose Byrne, who I feel like is one of the most underrated actresses out there between comedic and drama stuff, she did a great job as Myra, as uh, Myra McTaggart. Really, really awesome getting to see that character come into uh, come into play from the comics and everything like that. Who does have a romance? It does have a big uh, relationship and uh, acting as a liaison between the uh, X Men and the, uh, the U.S. government and all that stuff. So getting to see the way that they were able to bring that into this film and just make it seamlessly um, go into the plot and just fit in in the way that uh, just feels. Um, natural with it was awesome and then uh, getting to see Zoe Kravitz in here as Angel that was pretty cool as well that's an X-Men character that's definitely much more of a side character that you don't see a lot in uh, media uh, you know like between um, live action or animation so this was pretty cool getting to see Zoe Kravitz of all people play it way earlier in her career and obviously you know she's got uh, some some famous lineage behind her with her mom being in you know the Cosby show and all that stuff back in the day but she really, really came to play and actually showed a lot of promise. And it was kind of a bummer she wasn't in any any of the other X-Men films, but she's gone on to do a ton of great stuff. And she's obviously playing Catwoman now in The Batman. Don't know if she's going to be in Part 2 coming out in 2026, I think now. So we'll see where that all goes. But she was phenomenal in 2022's The Batman. Loved her version of uh, Catwoman. If it wasn't for Michelle Pfeiffer just being the GOAT far and away, Zoe Kravitz will be my, will be my favorite, but it's kind of between those two, at least in my mind. And then Nicholas Holt as Hank McCoy, a.k.a. Beast. He was pretty damn good as well. Really good casting. And uh, there was one more I wanted to mention. Let me check my list. And uh, Jason Fleming as Azazel. I thought he, he captured a really cool vibe as well, a.k.a. Nightcrawler's Pops. So that was really cool getting to see that whole thing play in, the, play in there. And they never really went into the, the lineage of Mystique being his mom or anything like that in the X-Men film. So them kind of sidestepping that whole thing made a lot of sense in this as well, but just kind of seeing that character play a part in the film and being a part of the Brotherhood of Mutants or the kind of the first iteration of them before he goes on and joins up with Magneto proper by the end of the film, I thought was just so well done. And when it comes to, this, to the film itself and all the different scenes and everything, it's just almost like every sequence, sequence after sequence after sequence, it's just so fucking awesome. Like the whole setup of the film where you get to see like uh, uh, Charles Xavier's background and how he met uh, Raven, a.k.a. Mystique, and everything like that as a kid when she's going into his house to steal food and whatnot, going out there just kind of scavenging, trying to make it out for herself and getting to see their whole relationship build to where they are in college now at university. Charles Xavier is now becoming a full-on professor and earning that uh, degree, if you will, and kind of getting that whole uh, lineage behind him. And, you know, getting to see James McAvoy really step into this character and bring a lot of the same essence that Patrick uh, Stewart brought to it in the original X-Men trilogy, but bring his own flavor to playing a younger version of him where he's a little more of a playboy or a little bit more of a younger man so he can bring a little more swagger to it. And I thought um, him adding in kind of some of that old school kind of James Bond flavor in moments I thought was kind of cool. Not like making him too, you know, over the top cool or something like adventure or something like that, but just kind of adding some of that swagger to Charles Xavier, I thought was kind of cool playing it as a younger dude and everything like that. Because Patrick Stewart has a lot of charisma on screen as well, which is one of the big reasons why he's remained so relevant over the last 20-some, 30-some years, way after he did Star Trek and things like that and uh, um, everything. And people wanted him as Charles Xavier from the beginning. People really knew Patrick Stewart had, had the gravitas to play the more dramatic side of it as well. And don't get me wrong, so does James McAvoy. He delivers in every single emotion, every single thing he has to do as an actor. James McAvoy is in one of, is one of my personal top 10 actors working today. I love James McAvoy, and it all started with this film. And every other film I've seen him after that, he even has one coming out later this year called uh, Speak No Evil, which looks really good. Might be a, a bit uh, cliche being a remake of a foreign film, who knows. But I'm sure his performance is going to be as phenomenal as it seems in the trailer, seeing what he did in Split as that character and just playing all those different personalities. You know, this guy should already have an Oscar on his shelf, you know. And it's just um, really awesome getting to see the work that he put in as Charles Xavier in this film. And his scenes with Michael Fassbender 
as Eric Lenshner are just so powerful, so well done. You can feel the same dynamic that Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart built in or set up in those previous films building up right here. And you just feel the chemistry of them as actors and performers really comes together well in this one. And it's just so awesome to see these guys trade scenes back and forth and the way they're able to build the camaraderie over the film. And then when it comes to the conflict of it, they're able to sell it so well. And just and just every time you see Michael Fass or the first time you get to see Michael Fassbender put on the helmet, you know, the block out the telepathy and really become full on Magneto in the third act of the film is so fucking awesome, man. So I just love watching those two every single time in this film. So great. And like I said with Kevin Bacon, he's just chewing up the scenery as Sebastian Shaw and delivering in the kind of Nazi parts in the beginning of the film where he's pushing Eric to unleash his powers by killing his mother in front of him and whatnot and essentially torturing the guy, you know what I mean, and just totally breaking him mentally to kind of force that stress to kind of trigger his mutation, if you will, so... And do it again because they know he has the he has the capability of doing it and want to weaponize that against you know everyone else that's trying to take them down World War II stats all that other stuff and getting to see the whole revenge tale of Michael Fassbender carrying out those scenes as Eric Lynch as well were so awesome and you could totally see how we got gl Inglorious Bastards from this because well done awesome stuff uh, but yeah man and like I said Rose Byrne turns in a really great performance here as well I thought she was really well cast and it's too bad kind of in Days of Future Past she gets lost in the shuffle a little bit and, and beyond that point doesn't really play much of a role in these films really in any real critical way because I thought she was so well set up here so well cast and just did such a great job that they kind of dropped the ball on that regard and bringing that character in not really fully uh, f developing that further on in the sequels but that's a problem for another day in this film it's freaking awesome. It's freaking rad. And all the action scenes are top notch. Like Magneto trying to pull the freaking submarine back when Sebastian Shaw is getting away. And the whole way that he turns the satellite and everything like that and turns all the missiles around back on all the different um, uh, international militaries that are targeting the mutants there and the Cuban Missile Crisis or whatever that's going on. And just the whole action sequence that takes place before that leads them to that whole conflict. Just every action scene and every moment of uh, the mutants using their powers and showing their abilities is so well done. It's so seamless the way the CGI and all that stuff comes together with the special effects. You just forget that it's not real, you know what I mean? While you're watching it and kind of get swept up in the adventure and whatnot. And it's just so awesome. So, yeah, this has always just been one of my favorite X-Men films of all time. <laughs> it's always going to be... And it's going to be a, t a, a tough one to beat because there's very few X-Men movies that I feel even touch this or get close to it. There's only two actual true X-Men team films that I think are as good as this. And I think there's two solo X-Men or mutant adjacent films that I think are better or I enjoy more, I guess you could say. But when it comes to true X-Men team films, this may be my absolute favorite. We'll see. We're going to have a whole tier list at the end of this thing after we cover all the installments, all uh, 13? installments of this thing however many installments we got going through everything to new mutants and all that leading up to deadpool 3 and as i mentioned earlier in the review series we're going to cover the quadrilogy of first class days of future past um uh what is it uh apocalypse Woo, that's a stinker and dark phoenix we're going to cover all those then we're going to finish up um uh, then we're going to jump into New Mutants and jump all the way out of there into a whole different timeline real quick then we're going to jump back and do the wolverine Logan, and then finish up with the two Deadpool films leading into Deadpool and Wolverine. I figured it'd be proper to just do all the Wolverine and Deadpool content leading right into their team-up movie and that sequel and whatnot and everything like that, because I think Logan is especially going to take, uh, Logan and potentially things in the Wolverine, I think, are going to be very important. And, of course, everything stems from Wolverine and Logan's beginnings of the X-Men franchise to the shitty-ass X-Men Origins Wolverine, so I'm sure we're going to get some more jokes from that. So that's kind of the order of things that we're going to be doing. You should be getting this review here and Days of Future Past within this whole uh, seven-day week uh, period, I would say. And then the next two installments are going to drop the following week if everything goes according to plan. And then, like I said, once July hits, it's going to be full-on Deadpool and Wolverine time uh, specifically on the channel. Then we're going to have all the Deadpool and Wolverine spoiler discussions, all that stuff. And then we're going to do a whole tier list, including Deadpool and Wolverine, of all these X-Men installments that are going to lead us into the next era, the MCU era, if you will. So if you enjoy these X-Men reviews, let me know and, um, you know, drop your comments down below. And we're going to definitely take such a deep dive into the next movie and just go into all the different comic book references, differences and things like that 
all my a breakdown of my top favorite scenes and everything and just get really in depth have another big real kind of personal memory seeing that so we're going to get even more in depth on the next one if this wasn't in depth enough for you but you know i just got the comic book on trade paperback so we're going to do some more direct comparisons and really take a deep dive on days of future past always been one of my favorites but due to the fact that it pulls from a direct storyline and pulls from all the x-men films there's a lot of really good juicy easter eggs and details we can dig into for the next one for sure and this is just kind of tee all that up so thank you for joining us and thanks for sticking around to the end if you did x-men first class it kicks ass if you haven't seen it by now and you didn't mind me spoiling anything that happened in it go out and check it out now go find it on your streaming service buy the damn thing on amazon so you can keep it in case they yank it off the internet forever get it now x-men first class it's the best it's one of the best ones i would say not the best but it's one of the best ones so quick spoiler for the tier rank but yeah man so we got more x-men content coming at y'all and don't be sleeping on any of the other stuff we got going on the boys season four the premiere is this week, so we're going to be covering that, however many episodes they drop for that. And if I can squeeze it in, you might even get a season three review, doing a little bit of catch up from last year, leading into The Boys, because I love that show. House of the Dragon coming out this Sunday. Look out for that following uh, spoiler discussion and recap on the following Monday. I'm going to be rewatching that season as well, uh, season one, getting all prepared to dive back into, uh, you know, the world of Game of Thrones and all that. So. Uh, make sure you stay tuned. You don't sleep on anything we got going on around here, guys. And we're going to catch you on the next uh, review and on the next video in general. And until then, stay safe out there, y'all. Peace.